Welcome yeah. to episode number. I thought you had a. So sorry. No, I don't have a. Where this is another shop talk episode number. Wait, that didn't <laughs> sound very good. It could be thirty. I'm not tricking anybody. You're fading. Did I hear a niner in there? Yeah, great that. movie. No friends or something. <laughs> so yeah, we we're uh, we're back on the stick. It's winter time right now. It is just after Thanksgiving. Still November. We just finished up with all the Black Friday shenanigans. Yep. So we just did this podcast purely to escape the retail floor and uh, all the other <laughs> responsibilities that we have. So here you go. Um, but yeah, we we kind of put some feelers out, and we thought this would be a cool uh, topic to cover. Give me a good Michael <laughs> Scott uh, drum roll. <laughs> Okay. All right. You you, know, you got I'm anything, Lance? I'm not going to top okay. that. Okay. All right. <laughs> We're going to talk about streamers, specifically fishing streamers in rivers. So, yeah, that is what we are going to do. We have a whole bunch of suggestions that uh, maybe for future reference, but uh, talk about streamers in rivers. Now, when you when we're talking about uh, the streamers, I mean, I think that everybody kind of has this this thought of streamer fishing as like that's like black magic. I can't do it. There are other guys like Brigham Six Weight Wilson who only fishes streamers, <laughs> right? And so, like, where when do you decide to like put a streamer on, Lance? When do I decide? Yeah. I don't know. Whenever I feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's nothing that the fish are doing darting around. Oh, there could be, right? But I often fish streamers through the winter because I like fishing streamers. Mm -hmm. uh, I fish them in the spring and fall quite a bit, I guess. I tend to fish streamers the least when I have dry fly opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. Even this time of year, like my last few trips out on the river, uh, I fish streamers in the morning. And then once the bluings get going or you see some midges around and I find some fish rising, once I have the chance to fish dries, I'll fish <laughs> dries, and once the rises disappear, <coughs> bless you, mm -hmm. then I will get back to the streamer fishing. Uh, that's yeah. when I choose to do it, but everybody's I, different. I think that's a good point because I think that people are looking for certain behaviors in fish sometimes before they decide to put a streamer on. And uh, when you're fishing a streamer, you're just kind of taking advantage of the, the biology of the fish. You know, they're just designed to kill stuff and eat it. So, the, I, I mean... Just like Lance said, if you want to fish streamers, go ahead and fish them. If they work, then awesome. Keep well, and I think it. also people get on the flip side of it. They think, oh, it's fall time, time to throw streamers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that couldn't that can certainly be a good time. Yeah. But uh, there's also lots of other good time in the dead of winter can be really good. Right. Um, it just depends. So uh, I, I'm kind of like you, where I'd probably say. Uh, <laughs> You know, if nothing's super great happening nymph wise, or there's some dry fly, or you know, dry flies are not on the table. Um, I'm trying to think, would I, if dry flies were really popping, would I ever throw streamers? Probably not. I totally would. Like Absolutely. not ever, but I'm saying, yeah. I unless I knew it was gonna be really good. But I would say most of the time I throw dries. But streamer fishing can also be just so much fun and i think that's what we'll talk about a little today is maybe some different strategies and um different ways to look at it you know i think haven't. you know you're, you're talking about nymphing and dry fly fishing that's all visual right you're you're watching the fish you're watching a cider you're watching an indicator streamer fishing is so cool because it's all feel like you get to feel it when that fish yeah. smacks your fly i think that's really cool so let's talk about gear a little bit um we talk about rods, we talk about lines, talk about tippet. We don't necessarily need to talk about reels too much because uh, kind of just choose whatever reel you like. But uh, what's your favorite streamer rod right now, Curtis? Um, probably the ESN three weight 10 footer. <laughs> <laughs> Big streamers on right. Hero Rig. Urge, <laughs> timeout. Yeah, people uh, are coming in and ask for that now. No, I guess. Uh, well, the one I've been actually using the most is the, uh, maybe on local rivers would be <clears throat> a five weight igniter. Yeah. Sage. Um, from the boat, the nine and a half six weight igniter, I think is the one I've used most, but also the IMX 
Pro nine and a half foot six weight. It's been a good one, and that one's not going to break your bank. Um, so the one we used. Oh, the Recon nine and a half foot six weight. It's a good one yeah. for that. Um, I don't. I mean, yeah. So that's kind of my list. I, I think people um, often think you have to have a different rod. Uh, right. it certainly helps in some cases. Um, if you want to go for bigger fish and bigger water, it could it could help. But yeah, I mean, you could fish like a little small weighted bugger or something with a five weight, no issue. Uh, but you're right. I mean, if you're if you're choosing a dedicated rod for streamer fishing, that that igniter is really good because it's so fast. Yeah. You know? And I I like about a nine and a half foot six weight. Um, I also have some seven weights that I love to throw streamers with. They they really throw the big stuff yeah. well. And if you if you pair that up with like a Titan taper line, it turns stuff over pretty good. What's your story, Lance? Yeah, agreed. I, it just <clears> depends <throat> on what you're doing for me. Uh, I've mostly been fishing one and two weight Euro rods with jig streamers lately, um, mostly for tippet protection. You fish real thin tippet, even with the streamer set with the rod, the rod gives a lot. I don't want a three or a four because I break off a little bit more, but mm -hmm. fishing like five or six X and allowing streamers to get deep quick and stay in contact is a real advantage. So I've been fishing that a lot with jig streamers. Otherwise, uh, it just depends on, like you mentioned, size of streamer and size of water. On a lot of our local smaller waters, I'll fish a 10 foot four weight with either a floating line or sometimes a, a Titan sink tip and occasionally like a 150 grain sink tip if the, if the flows are high enough. And on bigger rivers, I usually favor a six weight personally, um, usually a 10 footer like the Sage X or the Scott Centric or something, you know, a Loomis NRX Plus, something that's a pretty powerful 10 foot six weight. Um, you know, I don't think that it really matters that much in those rods as far as they're all quality casting tools, all very powerful. Uh, and I usually throw tandem streamers in, with the exception of when I'm fishing uh, Euro streamers. Jigging streamers, I usually just fish one. Hmm. Maybe, maybe break down just bird's eye view of the difference of fishing a euro streamer versus like a stripping streamer rig uh well rig, just for I, people to understand yeah i mean the rig's <clears throat> totally different the and starting with the fly let's say the jig streamer needs to be super super heavy super dense um usually small right a jig streamer most of the time would be oh you could fish them as big as you want but most of the time we fish them in like sixes eights tens even twelves um <coughs> with you know four mil beads on the small end of things, sometimes more like four, six, four and a half mil beads with lead wire bodies, or in big water, I'll fish like a 5.5 slotted bead just to help get down. Uh, so starting that way, we're trying to cast a five mil, five and a half mil bead on a on a sink tip or whatever you've got with a six, seven, doesn't matter. It's, it's doable, but it's a lot of density in one spot. So usually you would make that streamer have lead eyes, maybe a little bit of lead under the body or lead free wire, however you want to make that, uh, and spread the weight out a little bit more so it's a little easier to cast. Where uh, And then the next next step would be leader construction. Euro rig, we're using a Euro leader, ideally as fine as you are comfortable casting, as thin diameter, I should say. Uh, and then much thinner tippet because you're setting with the rod um, versus stripping streamers, shorter, stouter leaders, I usually use a, a short compact butt section that is semi-permanent. I just tie like 20 and, and 15 pound fluoro to all of my sink tip lines, terminate at a tippet ring, and then just run 0x, 1x, 2x, whatever from the tippet ring down. And uh, stripping streamers, like say those, those diameters zero through about two are kind of most common mm -hmm. for me, where Euro, Euro's jig streamer, that's too heavy. I mm -hmm. would sometimes fish four, but Rare, I don't really ever fish any thicker than four on a jig streamer setup. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's that's another thing. Like, um, I, I I had a thought in my mind to to follow up on that. No, we we were talking about uh, rods. We the the tippet construction, like the, your leader construction, and we've done that with all of our Stillwater stuff. If you've talked to us in the shop, we use that a ton, mm -hmm. and it's a game changer. And the reason for that is because. The butt section on a taper leader is mostly like 40, 60 pound tests, and it just isn't going to cut through the water very well, right? So that is that why we're yeah, favoring a typical a, taper leader uh, would be, you yeah. know, if you bought it, let's just say you bought a 0x taper leader, it's got probably 024, maybe 025, 30, maybe 40 pound test in some materials, but 25, 30 pound test in, in most, and that doesn't sink very fast. 
So even on a dense sinking line, it's gonna be hard for the line to pull that thick stuff down. And usually with streamers, you have enough energy in the cast, you have <coughs> enough uh, stiffness and mass in like 20 pound to still turn it over and mm -hmm. have accuracy, but it's just, it's thinner and, and with fluorocarbon, it's a teeny tiny bit more dense, so it allows your streamer to get to depth quicker. Mm -hmm. And the, the funny thing is we uh, we had a day on the Green River a couple of years back in January, was it? Was it January? Yeah. And we were all fishing this tandem rig with heavy streamers and just absolutely crushing fish like it was it was really really cool the other thing that about that leader setup is after the tippet ring typically you're you're putting you know a, a triple surgeon's knot with a tag there so if you're fishing tandem you're never tying off the bend of a streamer right right so when that happens when you tie off the bend of a streamer streamers typically have really movable tails and they get all wrapped up if you tie a, a piece of line off the bend of the hook. So tags are the way to go there. And spacing out your streamers is, is big. That's something that we've learned as well is, you know, if your streamers are 18 inches apart, you know, fish might get confused or might not, might be indecisive on which one to eat. Um, so if you space them out a little bit, you might have a little bit better luck. Let's talk about lines a little bit more. Like, like we mentioned you mentioned a little, a few lines like sink tips and full sinks and floating lines. Like when, when would you choose one or the other? Um, so for me, if I can get, and it also depends on where, where the fish are on a given river. <clears throat> if they're not hanging out too deep, I always like a floating line for most of what I do. Um, and um, if I have, you know, like. When we're on the green, we're usually throwing sink tip lines or something that's going to be able to get down a little quicker. Because um, it's also a balance. Like, do you want super heavy weighted flies or, um, you know, decently weighted flies in a sink tip or line to get your flies down to depth? And it kind of also depends on the motion you want, too, where uh, more kind of a uh, even keeled flies and retrieves, um, you'd be better off having a sinking line than really heavily weighted flies. Um, and then sometimes uh, you have to kind of pick your poison because there's going to be fish shallow and sometimes a sinking line would be too much. And so you're, you know, so it's just mostly <coughs> depth of the rivers where you are, depth of where the fish are holding and you know, what the retrieve is, I guess. They're, I like think it. also current speed has something oh, yeah. to do with it because if you have quick current and you can you just need to cut through that, then you need maybe a little bit yeah. faster sink. And line. you're not likely to uh, change the lines all day for every specific spot. Right. You're kind of playing averages there. Yeah. If it's mm -hmm. average, whatever the average depth is, you're going to have the line that's best for that. Yeah, <coughs> which you can adjust your retrieve and fly, you know, selection yeah. to, to accommodate that too. I think one thing that's that's often overlooked is leader construction based on fly lines. So if you're fishing a floating line, you have a sinking fly with a streamer, generally speaking, right? It's going to sink at least a little. Uh, they, you can get them in various weights, but generally you want it to be getting below the surface. And with that in mind, traditional streamer knowledge is short leader, right? But with a floating line, a lot of times a long leader is an advantage, especially with mm -hmm. a bit more tippet yeah. to help it get down. Because again, the streamer won't pull that thick butt section of a tapered leader down very well so a long leader on a floating line might be an advantage you know as long as you can come to the cast you don't you don't need a 20 footer of course but you know rather maybe rather than a five or seven and a half foot leader you might get a nine or ten foot leader to allow your streamer to get down with the floating line versus most sinking tip or full sinking options you're better uh, getting a much shorter leader <coughs> something that uh, allows the the fly to be pulled down with the fly line so you know the one thing one mistake that's common there is you get a dense sinking line type 5 type 7 whatever it is and you have a 9 foot leader on the end and your fly is all the way yeah. up here and your line's way down below and you're kind of negating the, the you know the reason to have a sinking line so keeping that butt section short that's another reason we build our own butt sections is we don't want them to be too long so mm -hmm. we have that semi-permanent attachment to the tippet ring, add maybe two to three feet of tippet to our first fly, triple surgeons, leave the tag. That's going to be your first fly and, and second fly on the terminal end, assuming that's legal where you live. Two flies isn't legal everywhere. but And that's, that's, a, that's another point. Like um, when I fish a, a smaller river, say like the Provo, 
it's really critical to have a fly that has some weight to it, yeah. right? Because it needs to be able to get down. You don't have any line that's helping it. You have small holes. You don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Big rivers, though, when you're fishing a sink tip or a, a you know a full sink or whatever, that's when you can get into fishing some of these you know weightless or or slightly weighted streamers, right. and they're going to get down a little bit on big better. water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Spe speaking of that, so let's let's talk about that. The fly selection. So what? What, how, how do you select flies when you go throw streamers? So I've actually, this season, we, I've noticed a lot more people coming in the shop looking for really big flies um, for the Provo. Not to say that they wouldn't work, um, but I think fly <coughs> selection begins a little bit with uh, what the fish are actually eating. Like, because they are uh, going to chase down smaller fish or, or they'll, chase a, a sculpin or, or something that's, you know, natural. Mm -hmm. um, other times you can throw whatever, I guess, and they'll, they'll just eat it because it pisses them off or whatever. But right. I, I think <laughs> often I see people get into this, it's, it's a streamer. I got to be throwing it with a, you know, a big rod with this big fly. Big rod, big fly, big fish. Yeah. Freaking A. Bro. And, uh, and, and not really understanding or thinking about, mm -hmm. maybe understanding is a bad word, but thinking about like the <laughs> where you're going to be fishing it and kind of the conditions. Yeah. I mean, you, you can certainly catch big fish on big flies, of course. but um, often those big fish are not eating gigantic meals. Yeah. Especially if that's not what they're seeing. Right? Yeah. Like one thing I think to your point that's often overlooked is people just get in the, I have to throw a giant streamer mentality and that's cool and everything. But if the fish are used to eating sculpin that are all three inches, two yeah. inches long, and you're throwing them a five, six, seven inch long <clears> fly, <throat> it doesn't even often, you know, will they be aggressive? Sure. Can they be, can they be territorial? Of course, but you're going to trick one out of a thousand that way, instead of feeding them something they might see much more often. Yeah. You know, if your river has leeches, if your river has crayfish, if it has sculpin, if it has lots of little dace or tons of juvenile trout, then you know, you can imitate things that are in those size ranges and, and be most uh, productive, I think, most efficient that way with your fly selection. And that you nailed it. Like efficiency is, is key with that. doesn't mean that you're not going to catch fish on the big flies. I mean, you'll still catch fish on those, but I think sometimes, you know, looking at the overall aspect of it, like you guys talked about, finding what the fish are actually eating and getting closer to that mm -hmm. is absolutely critical. We joke a lot about uh, the streamer junkies then measuring the, their effectiveness of their day by how many fish they moved. They right? moved. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> I must have moved 100 today. Yeah, how many did you catch? Four. <laughs> so that that's funny because, like, when we first started floating the, the Provo up here, <coughs> me, I'm still getting over this nasty cold. Have you tried had. water instead of this monster stuff? Yeah, I had, like, two gallons of it before. I don't water doesn't that. wake me up very much. <laughs> but anyway, we'd go fish the Provo, and if you threw, like, an articulated fly, you would move a lot of fish. You would totally move a lot of fish. But the second you sized down and got it to look maybe more sculpin-y, you'd start hooking up a, a ton yeah. more fish. It was like the fish would come in and escort mm -hmm. the bigger fly out. Yeah. It felt like, oh, look at that big thing. I'm just going to scooch it out here, check it out. But once you got into smaller stuff man they would just start to pound oh yeah so and that's just what you were saying lance where yeah i mean there's there's times the fish are going to chow on something huge but really if they're forage bases those smaller things yes yeah. that's, that's what you look at and on the flip side some people are just trying they're not trying to catch 10 20 right. 30 fish a day yeah, they're trying like to catch one big the granddaddy one. and maybe that's your target in that case throw a giant fly yeah. and see if you can find one but yeah. you know know that you're going into it i guess some people come in the shop i feel like and they buy the giant fly thinking they're just going to go catch all the big fish in the river won't be able to resist it and there aren't that many big fish in the river and <laughs> yeah, so that's true you're you're kind of i guess you just have to go into it knowing in my opinion that you're going to cut your numbers of fish and your activity level way down be willing to throw a lot more casts and if you're willing to do that and put the time and yeah. effort in just for one large fish then have at it right that's great yeah and you might also catch that same large fish throwing small flies too. yeah that's so. the other the other yeah. side of that theory is the you know averages again if you're throwing average flies that the fish feed on and you catch 50 of them out of those 50 you're probably going to catch a few that are above the average right mm -hmm. you're also going to catch some that are below the average but you're going to have a lot more fun in the meantime and feel like for yeah. me at least i feel like i've patterned the fish i've i've got something that i that i can recreate and not just 
hope, uh, you know, put in tons of hours to hope for one large fish. Yeah. So, and the other thing to consider with streamers is if you're tying your own streamers, you need to think of streamers as almost an investment. I mean, they're expensive if you buy them. Um, but like, it's not like a betis where you're going to go through six of this dry fly that the fish are really on. Like a, a streamer, I mean, you're using thicker tippet, um, you shouldn't be losing streamers a ton. So I, I think that if you use the best hooks that you can, um, make sure that you have a hook hone on you as well. I think that's a very important part of it. Streamers have the tendency to nick rocks and get rolled points. So doctor them up, keep them going. And streamers can last a whole, well, a, a, quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, it's not the worst thing in the world that they take a long time to tie. Um, because I mean, you, you know, put them together, right. You're, you're not going to go through streamers like you would like a normal nymph. Right. And I need to articulate all streamers, <clears throat> right? Wrong. <laughs> I have strong opinions about this because I, I, I've kind of gone more toward fishing small streamers lately. Um, I have a bunch of articulated stuff, uh, that I really like to fish, but I mean, you, you'll have guys that want to articulate like a size six and a size eight i mean you're you're talking like this big and my rule of thumb is and this is just my opinion might not be right but look at the width of that fish's mouth and if that fish has any chance of getting both of those hooks in its mouth at the same time those hooks are going to work against each other trying to set that you're going to get a much better hook set if you can just get one hook in the mouth at a time now how do you do that well, you don't put two hooks really close together. You know, you space them out maybe, I don't know, a few inches. So if a fish's mouth, like the biggest fish you're going to catch is about that wide or something like that, and you have an articulated streamer like that long, you might have struggles hooking up. I've, I've seen it. But make sure you have good clearance on your articulated hooks. Yeah. And if you, if you do want to have an articulation on a small fly, what I do is I just cut the back hook off or just use a shank on yeah. the back because it will still give you that good Yeah, because I think at that point you're looking for movement. You're not necessarily exactly. hoping to have 100%. a second hook point in the mix. You know, I mean, it got real ridiculous one year when guys were coming in asking to what hooks they should use to articulate a damsel fly. <laughs> like I can understand you want it to wiggle, you know, but yeah. don't put a hook, don't put two <laughs> hooks on a size 10, you know, <laughs> anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, you hear, well, these fish just, they, they sideswipe, they stun. Oh, they only eat from the head. They only eat from the tail. It's like, you know, they might only eat from the head, but let's say they're just escorting that fly out of its hole and it's just saying, hey, get out of here. And it's nipping at its tail the whole way back, you know, so who knows? I don't they're, think that they always eat, they swallow by the head. But mm -hmm. having uh, worked at Cabela's with a giant aquarium yeah, and yeah. having fed the fish hundreds of times and watching them, they'll T-bone a fish and then spin it around to eat it head first. Mm -hmm. And they'll T-bone it right in the dead middle. They'll eat it in the back and then spin it all the way around. But they, they, they want to, first and foremost, they got to capture it, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think that, I think we, they do eat it head first, yeah. but I think people mistake that with... They, they that's how they attack I should it. say they swallow yeah. it head first, but they don't necessarily attack it head first. They'll attack it any way they can. They that's a really it. good, like, that is a they great swallow point. it head first, yeah. but they don't eat it head first yeah, all right, the time. Right. That's a good, good yeah. point. And then if we switch gears back to fly lines, one other thing we didn't touch on, uh, we talked about floating lines and sinking tips. We didn't talk about full sink lines, and full sink lines are certainly usable with streamers. Uh, the one catch there is if you're a wading angler. A wading angler... When you're stripping in a full sinking line and you're stripping it in your feet and you're making with streamers, you're often making relatively long casts, right? The sinking line sinks at your feet as well. And if it's in water deeper than like three inches, you won't be able to create enough line speed to pull the line back through the water without prematurely turning your leader over. So for the wading angler, a sink tip with a floating running line is a real necessary piece of equipment or just a floating line. Versus if you're in a drift boat in a raft, you know, from any sort of boat and you're stripping into the boat, then the full sink line can still work really well because you're stripping into the boat. The one catch there is you could wade fish with a stripping basket. I've tried it. I don't love it because yeah. getting the line to land in the stripping basket when you're trying to do fast, you know, erratic retrieves doesn't work very well. But in a pinch might be the best option. But ideally, if you're a wading angler, a sinking tip or a floating line, and if you're a boat angler, I would say you want all the above. You want 
floating lines, several different sinking tips and or sinking lines. Yeah, the other reason I personally don't like full sinks as much, especially for rivers specifically. For rivers specifically, mm -hmm. yeah, um, is mending. So mm -hmm. like if I get a cast, maybe it didn't go exactly where I needed it to, yeah. I need to mend to get to fly into the zone. Totally. Um, you know, any more than a few seconds delay and I'm sinking lines it's, down. It's down. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, great point. And yeah, and they also, if you're not in. careful, and I've, you know, just, I find myself doing that tomorrow if I went out and <clears throat> is, I don't think about sometimes where I'm stripping it to mm -hmm. and half will go between my leg and the other half go around. So depending <coughs> on where you are in the current, that's also kind of a pain. Curtis so Fry another. strips between his legs. <laughs> yeah. And that's even more prevalent on a river or on a wading angler. Yeah situation rather than the boat the boat you it's still an advantage in a lot of cases to reposition and mend the line uh, but as a waiting angler you can speed up your retrieve you can slow down and retrieve by mending the back end of it and repositioning it a lot so that's a very good point we left out for sure yeah the the mending part that's that's kind of what I was overlooking I really love fishing sinking lines like full sinks from the boat but being able to mend is is a big advantage yeah, for and if the you're floating tip. down the river pounding banks and that's all you're doing just leading the boat a yeah. little bit at the same angle all the time, all the time a full sink line can work great and it may work a lot better for what the fish mm -hmm. are doing good you know? yeah so speaking of that let's talk about some of the techniques here because i think that you know guys will come in as they'll get a bunch of streamers and they'll say okay i'm lost like i don't even know where to cast how to retrieve and so We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. I mean, you, you hear about, you know, Lance talked a little bit about Euro streamer versus stripping the streamer. Or Euro, you're, you're keeping the line tight, maybe animating the fly through the drift a little bit and getting them to eat, still watching the feel, maybe a little bit of cider movement that you're yeah, watching. Yeah, watching cider movement for sure. Versus, um, you know, stripping a streamer. You can strip it downstream, you can strip it across, you can strip it directly upstream. So I always say that, you know, you got to figure it out. It's a puzzle every single day. Sometimes the fish really want it one way or the other. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's something you got to figure out every day. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, short and <clears throat> quick retrieve versus long, slow pulls, jigging streamers, lots of short motions or longer lifting and dropping. I mean, there's all kinds of differences as far as presentation goes and a general rule of thumb for me is colder water slower presentation mm -hmm. warmer water to a point you know obviously <coughs> for trout warm water can in some places can get too warm yeah uh, then you know streamers are probably not the best option or just not fishing is not isn't the best option but uh assuming you're in you know normal safe trout temperatures then kind of the warmer the water to maybe low 60s then speeding it up fish want to you know 50 plus they want to chase quite a bit 50 minus you know or 40 high 40s and lower then slowing it down a bit and when you're in the high 30s or low 40s probably a real slow presentation is your friend keeping the fly in the strike zone a long time so that that brings me to the point all of you people who are listening in your car honk your horn if you go fishing with a thermometer in your vest <laughs> and not a lot of people are honking right now but you know that that's a good point. I mean, you just, just use science, right? You put it in the water. You can tell exactly, you know, what the temperature is, and you can adjust from there. Um, you know, you hear a lot about the jerk strip. You know, where you cast out and you use the rod to to move the the lure. Very popular technique with spinning gear. You know, with jerk baits, rip baits, mm -hmm. or whatever however you want to call it. And I love fishing that way with conventional gear. The issue with fly fishing with that. Because I used to do it a lot more than I do now. Sometimes you have to do it to animate your fly enough to get the fish to eat it. But when you're using the tip of your rod to animate your fly, as soon as your fly stops moving, there's a whole bunch of slack in your, in your fly yeah. line. And if a fish really eats it and just absolutely hammers it, no, no big deal. But a lot of times, that's if a fish crushes your streamer and you don't have tension ready to strip set right away, they can spit that just as, easy, as easily as they ate it. So I've I've actually done better casting out, just keeping my rod straight and pulling with the fly line directly in line with, with the fly rod. And you'll be able to like, you'll miss a lot of fish doing the the, the strip set or the jerk strip in, in, my, in my opinion, compared to the straight pull. What are, what's the, what's the te terminology for that? 
Yeah, strip setting with a straight bowl. I mean, yeah. to me, I think I don't do a lot of jerk strip retrieve, but uh, like you described, I think the disadvantage is when you move the rod away from the fly and then a fish eats it and you're trying to get contact, one, you may not feel it at all. <clears throat> Two, if you do, the rod is now giving and the tip is, yeah. you know, you're not setting the hook on it because the tip of the rod's too soft. You're not penetrating, moving the fly in the fish's mouth to actually get the hook penetrated. So you end up missing a lot of those fish. It can be a fun way to fish because usually you're doing that with big flies mm -hmm. and it can be very visual. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case and you can get tight to them quick enough, and like you said, if you have to fish that way, that's the ticket to get the fish mm -hmm. to eat, then by all means do it. But if efficiency-wise, <laughs> that's not the best retrieve. Just right. following the, with the rod tip. You, it, for me, they're having the rod tip subsurface or having it within six inches of the surface so that you don't have a big swing tip of line hanging down, a big mm -hmm. belly of line from your rod tip down. And then the other common mistake is not following, that I see anyway, is not following the, the retrieve. So if you make a cast here, current's going this direction, you make a cast here, but you're in your line and your flyer down there, but people keep stripping this way, and then their line starts being at a 90 degree mm -hmm. angle from the time the retrieve's done. So you make a cast here, and you should be rotating through, following, pardon me, follow, <laughs> following great. rookie mistake, following the, the, the line as it goes through the, the yeah, whole Yeah, that's retrieve. a great point. And Just staying in contact. And, and this Simple is stuff. this is even more driving home the point that you should put the best hooks you can on your streamers because you need those to get driven in deep into that fish's mouth. And if you have a, a, a hook that's, you know, got a giant barb on it, you know, if it's got maybe not the greatest quality hook point or if you've rolled a hook on it, you know, all that hard work that you put into trying to get a fish just to eat your fly and then to have your fly not be good like one story i have is i was fishing in a in a boat and a guide pulled out a streamer and he was going to tie it on for the guy fishing in the back and i could see the rolled point on that streamer that he was going to put on for him from the front so i'm mm -hmm. like hey let me see that real quick so i took it and i put it in the meat of my thumb and i pushed down i'm like see that i can't even break my skin with mm -hmm. this so I, I have a file always on me. Mm -hmm. I doctored it up and I'm like, see that? I'm like, if you're a guide and you want your clients to catch fish, they're not gonna be setting the hook very good. So you need to make sure that that's, that's dialed. Right. But, but that's, that's a deal breaker. I mean, a, a rolled point, if you're getting a lot of fish that just totally clobber your fly and you're not hooking up, check your hook points for sure. Yeah, make yeah. sure you're strip setting, not rod setting, and then check your hook point. And then the other <laughs> thing to consider there that's often overlooked is just wire thickness on the flies. On the, on the hook, I should say. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Too thin and on a streamer that you're strip setting. You know, a dry fly hook on a strip set streamer is going to open up. Too thick. You know, if you're using a saltwater hook and you're catching trout that are this big, it's not going to penetrate very well. Could it work? Of course it could, but you're just not going to get You don't have hook. the weight against it. You don't have enough. The fish doesn't have enough weight to, to actually move that fly and, and set that hook in there because the wire thickness, the gauge is just too thick. So there's a happy medium in there, and that varies depending on whether you're chasing, you know, tiny little creek trout um, or you're chasing, you know, a 15, 20 pound mm -hmm. Lahontan cutthroat or something. You got you to gotta weigh those uh, options and, and get, find a balance there, but just something to consider. Not all streamers should be on the heaviest wire hooks possible. And, yep. you know, you also don't want them to be too thin so that they're bending out when you go to get tight. And you know, I, I think that, you know, there are a lot of companies out there that have these like 4X heavy hooks and uh, people, people are buying those quite a bit, but like, you know, that, that's going to prevent you from catching fish, just like you said. But uh, I think everybody has it in their mind that, you know, this definitely won't bend out. You know, they had one hook back, you know, six years ago that bent out because they were fishing 2X on a size 16. Mm -hmm. And now all their hooks have to be just giant. Sure. We see that in the midge game even, you know, there's there are some hooks that are extra heavy, you know, like a 2488H, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a little bit too much juice for a 12 to 16 inch trout, you know. Yeah. But so that's that's something to, to think about. Like uh, we just got back from Dorado fishing and I caught a 30 pound Dorado on I think like a four aught Gamakatsu B10S. And you know, that's a that's a stout streamer hook, but there are lots of other hooks that are way heavier than that one, like a bunch of saltwater stuff. Even at that I felt on some of those bigger fish, you'd strip set and you'd feel some purchase, but not like 
full. Yeah. So I could still feel some flojo in there. Yeah. And then just rip it again. Yeah. And so, I mean, these are big fish with four or five out hooks. Yeah. And it would still take a fair bit to get them to penetrate. Oh, yeah. So if you think about, you know, even a, a one odd or whatever hook into a trout, it's yeah. still going to be tougher. It's just right. more, more wire to penetrate, and especially that, if you're barbed. Yeah, and that's the other thing is if if you know that you're fishing, you know, a six seven weight rod with two X tippet, uh, you you can kind of choose your hooks from there. Like you, if you know, you know what I'm I'm I've got a hook that's that's just standard wire. I'm not going to absolutely horse this fish in. Yeah, you don't have to. So just know what hook you have on your yeah. fly. Another advantage to tying your own. By the way, I know a shop where you can buy all the stuff to tie flies. Well, do tell flyfishfood.com <laughs> know the owners they're freaking awesome one of them's super good looking too actually i'm not an owner oh yeah <laughs> My I, the, that's funny we, every once in a while we'll have a we'll have a person come in the shop and they'll talk to me and curtis we're like yeah lance serious doing a good job since he opened this place up we're like yeah he's, he's doing a great job i'm trying <laughs> anyway what else on streamers do we need to go over um well um try it i think a lot it. of people get a little hesitant because it's you know it could be different gear and that yeah. that can add up but you know don't think you have to if you're a euro nympher and you want to try it try the jig streamer style stuff that's super easy to, like to make that transition if you only have a five weight then maybe go to a smaller river throw some smaller flies with the floating line just get into it that way you'll find yourself quickly branching out from there um you know whether you need to get a six or seven weight rod you know that's a great point because when i wanted to start learning streamers i i picked like the easiest little trout stream that yeah. like you could catch 100 fish on dries just do that with streamers and just size so everything fun. down yeah it's like, a blast. if you guys have a tr a trout stream or <laughs> even bluegill or bass you know and you got a lot of fish in there that's a great time yeah. They don't, you know, even if you can catch them on dry flies or nymphs or whatever, They're just really go throw some streamers. It's good yeah. practice. Go rip some streamers. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thanks for listening. Um, we'll be back. We're soon. like cranking. We're on a roll here yeah, with our podcast. Yeah. Comparatively so. speaking, we're yes, on a roll. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Peace out. <laughs>